Good morning. Welcome back to Foundations in Faith as we continue walking through the foundational teachings, the foundational beliefs of what it means to be Christian, what it means to be Lutheran. We've been walking through the Augsburg Confession, the Apology of the Augsburg Confession, mostly within the last few weeks. And as we continue forward, we get to a section on baptism. The problem, as we continue into the Apology and the Augsburg Confession, is that baptism wasn't viewed incredibly differently between who Luther and Melanchthon were writing against, over and against at the time, uh, the Roman Catholics, and Lutherans at the time, and Lutherans now. So there really isn't a whole lot within the Augsburg Confession and the Apology of the Augsburg Confession on baptism. Certainly not enough to spend um, a full video, maybe two videos, as we might continue on in our discussion of baptism next week as well. So to talk about baptism, we're going to turn to the small and the large catechism. Uh, we talked about this a couple weeks back, but really quick review, the small and the large catechism are uh, basically a, a very short primer on the foundational teachings that Lutheran wanted to get into families. He wanted to get this specifically to fathers in the family so they could instruct their kids, they could instruct their families on the basic tenets of Christianity, what they needed to know um, in order to be Christian, in order to be Lutheran. He spends quite a bit of time on baptism. Why does he spend so much time on baptism? Because it is a sacrament. Now, we're going to talk really quickly about sacraments as kind of an introduction, a background to baptism, because there's more than one sacrament. Baptism is a sacrament, but there's more than one within Lutheranism, within Christianity, uh, broadly speaking as well, although there are some variances. So really quickly, what does it take for something to be a sacrament, or what does it mean that something is a sacrament? Three conditions have to be met for something to be a sacrament. First, it must be commanded by Jesus. Second, it must bring about salvation or the forgiveness of sins. And then thirdly, it has to be tied to some sort of physical substance. So within Lutheranism, we have two, sometimes three sacraments, depending on how, uh, how you talk about it, who you talk about it. The first is baptism, which we'll be talking about today. Is it commanded by Jesus? Yes, Matthew 28, go into all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Does it bring about salvation, the forgiveness of sins? Yes, absolutely. The last chapter of Mark, um, Jesus says, if you, are belie if you believe and are baptized, you will be saved. Brings about the forgiveness of sins, the washing away of sins. Is it tied to a physical substance? Yes, absolutely. What's necessary for baptism to take place? There has to be water and there has to be the word of God. That word, go and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's why every time you see a baptism, those words will be spoken. I baptize you so-and-so, whatever their name is, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So those three things have to be present for something to be a sacrament. Those requirements are met within baptism. The other sacrament that's agreed upon within Lutheranism is the Lord's Supper. We'll get there, um, but is it commanded by Jesus? Yes, absolutely. Do this as often as you gather together in remembrance of me. Does it bring about salvation? Yes, he says it within the words of institution. This is my body, this is my blood, for the forgiveness of your sins. And is it tied to a physical substance? Yes, we have the bread and the wine that have to be present for the Lord's Supper. I say two, sometimes three sacraments within Lutheranism, um, because there is a third that some people believe is a sacrament, some people don't see as a sacrament um, because of that last criteria, and that would be confession and absolution. So is it commanded by Jesus? Yes, absolutely. Uh, Jesus commands us to repent from our sins, and Jesus commands us to forgive the sins of others. Does it bring about salvation? Yes. The forgiveness of sins? Yes. The way we get a little bit iffy, is it tied to a physical substance? Is confession and absolution tied to a physical substance or something here in this world? Some would say yes. Some would say it's tied to the person you're confessing to, whether that's a pastor, whether that's a friend. Um, some would say no, it, it can't be a person. It has to actually be a physical substance like the water or the wine and the bread. Um, so I don't get too hung up about that. If you want to say confession and absolution is a sacrament, go for it. If you want to say it's not, go for it. That's not a hill that I'm ready to die on. Um, and it really doesn't pertain to what we're talking about today as we talk about baptism. So what is baptism? Very strictly speaking, uh, when we get into the Greek of the word baptizo, what does it mean? Simply to apply water or to wash with water. And that's kind of where we get that, that requirement, that last requirement, what has to be present for baptism, the word of God and water, the application of water. Does it matter how much water? Nope. Doesn't matter at all. That's why we do uh, kind of sprinkled baptism here. Other denominations, other traditions do full immersion baptism. Some do any difference or any variance in between. It really doesn't matter how much water 
is present because, and this is important, what's effective, what's powerful within baptism isn't the water itself. We get asked this actually quite a bit, uh, probably because of some of the Catholic roots of Lutheranism and how we split off there. It's not holy water. It's not blessed water in any way, shape, or form. When Pastor Steve or myself does a baptism over in the sanctuary, we go to the sink in the back of the sanctuary, we fill up a pitcher of water, and we pour it in the baptismal font. So it's just regular, plain, old water. You can do a baptism in the ocean. You can do it in the pool. You can do a baptism with bottled water. It really doesn't matter the water. What's powerful and what is effective in baptism is the Word of God and the promise of God that's tied to that Word. So again, it doesn't matter the water. It matters all about the promise that comes with the Word. What is that promise? The promise is, if you believe and are baptized, you will be saved. There's faith, and then there's the sacrament. There's the washing away of sins. We get really deep into um, what baptism means, what it actually accomplishes. And I think this is why I'm going to do a second video. I'm going to talk again about baptism next week and walk through what Paul has to say about baptism, walk through Romans um, and the baptism imagery within Romans there. So really briefly, um, before we get to that, to that next week, what baptism does for us is it kills sin within our lives. It kills us, is one way to say it. We have died to sin, and as we come out of the waters of baptism, we are raised then to new life in Jesus Christ. Our sin is washed away, and forgiveness takes its place. So there's a lot going on within baptism. And again, this is why I'm going to spend next week talking about it as well, I think, and walk through what Paul has to say. Um, but really briefly, there's that imagery of the drowning of sin. There's the imagery of the putting to death of our old selves, the old Adam, and then being raised to new life in Jesus Christ, raised to new life to serve him, free from sin, free from the guilt of that sin. So, um, it is important, though, that faith is present at baptism. And this is to say that we shouldn't be going out to concerts, that we shouldn't be going out to large gatherings with a fire hose and spraying everybody and saying, I baptize you all. That's not how it works. Um, that's not how baptism is made effective. Faith has to be present on the part of the person being baptized. So that brings us to the next question, then. Who can be baptized or who should be baptized? The answer to that is actually pretty easy. Um, anyone who believes can and should be baptized. Anyone who believes. It doesn't matter what they look like. It doesn't matter how old they are. It doesn't matter if they're male or female. Anyone who believes, and Jesus says, Baptism is for you. Come to the waters of baptism. Receive this new life. Receive the beauty, the benefits, the gifts that are within baptism. Um, so that brings us to one of the controversial points of baptism, and that is infant baptism. You know, we see this talked about all the time, even within Lutheranism, um, as families that maybe have, have been brought into our denomination from different denominations say, well, I was Catholic before, and my kid hasn't been baptized yet, and I really want to wait until the age of accountability. Or, no, we really want to wait until they have their first communion and then have them baptized. We see this quite a bit in non-denominational, where they say, well, I really want my child to make their own decision and say they want to be baptized instead of us bringing them to baptism. Or, uh, as we've already said, faith needs to be present for baptism. There are some families that would say, well, my, my child, my three-day-old child, um, doesn't have faith. They can't express their faith. How can we know they have faith? We shouldn't baptize them. We should wait until they can express it. To all of that, um, Lutherans have taught and believed since the very beginning, since, since Luther himself, infants can and should be baptized. How do we do this? Why do we teach this? Um, for a lot of reasons. First, because Jesus never commands people to wait for a certain age. He never says, baptize all nations except the really little children that can't talk and that can't express their faith. Um, no, he says, go into all the nations. It's very inclusive. There's no excluded party. Go to all the nations, baptizing them. Um, and scripture never makes a distinction either for age within baptism. It never says they must be so-and-so age. They must be able to express their faith. They must be able to whatever. It never makes that distinction. So it's a little bit of an argument from silence in saying that scripture never prohibits it. Scripture never also commands that you baptize infants. That is to say, it never explicitly says, go and baptize adults and children and infants. So scripture is a little bit silent on that word infants. But from that, we can draw some conclusions. So we can say, as you look at different baptisms within Acts, say, and it, it talks about an entire household of Stephanus being baptized. 
Well, it makes sense at that time, especially as people were having lots and lots of kids, that his entire household would have included children, would have included infants as well. And there's no distinction made at that point. We see in Jesus' ministry all the time, he doesn't exclude children, he doesn't exclude infants from his care, from his mercy, from his ministry, and from his kingdom. Rather, he invites children to himself. He says, you must have a childlike faith to be saved. And then there's the famous scene, we quote it within our baptism liturgy, uh, where people are bringing children to Jesus to have him bless them. When you get into the Greek of that, the, the children there is actually a really bad translation. I wish we would translate it as infants, because it, it basically means newborn children or children that aren't able to walk on their own. They can't walk, they probably can't talk, they probably can't express their faith either. Um, and yet Jesus welcomes them to himself. Jesus says, bring the little children to me, don't bar them. So we apply all of this to our teaching and our practice of baptism to say that Jesus welcomes children, even infants, to himself, welcomes them to his kingdom and into his family. Why would we place a barrier in there? Why would we say you have to be a certain age? No, rather bring them to baptism, bring them into the family, and then raise them within that new identity, raise them within that baptized identity. Um, this applies to a lot more than just children, though. This applies to a whole host of people. You think about someone who suffers from a disability that's unable to express their faith. They've been in church. They've been hearing the word. We think they might have faith. We're not 100% sure because they can't express it. Should they be baptized? Yeah, absolutely. They should be baptized. Uh, think of a person who perhaps has been going to church their whole life. They were never baptized for whatever reason. Uh, now they've fallen ill and they're in a coma and they can't express that faith. And yet there's the evidence of faith. They've been active in their church. They've been going to church. They've risen, raised their family in the church. Could they be baptized before they pass away? Yes, absolutely. We should bring baptism um, to those people, even if they can't express their faith. At the same time, if someone is firmly against Christianity, if they're not in church, if they're not practicing or living out their faith, should they be baptized? No, probably not. Um, they shouldn't be baptized because they don't have faith present. Um, so this it applies to a whole, a whole host of people, even beyond just infants. Um, but we believe that if faith is there, if faith is present in any way, shape, or form, yeah, you should be baptized. Can infants have faith? Absolutely. Studies have been done um, quite a bit on uh, children that are still in the womb, and can they hear? And from a certain age, children in the womb can hear. They react to mom's voice. They react to dad's voice. They react to music. Um, so as the mom is present within church, hearing the word, that infant also is hearing the word. We believe that God is more than capable of kindling faith even in an unborn child. And so as that child is born, as that child comes into the world, they can have that little kernel of faith. They can have that faith like a mustard seed. And we encourage the family to bring that child into um, baptism, into the church, to welcome them into the family of God in that way, and then raise them again in that baptismal identity. We'll talk a lot more about that baptismal identity next week. I'm really going to dive deep into that. Um, so all that to say, infant baptism is uh, its a recognition of the promise that hearing the word brings faith and that faith can and is worked in children. Uh, it's also a statement from the family that this child is in the family of God, will continue to raise this child in the faith, will continue to nurture and to grow that faith within the child um, and bring them up within the church as well. And then there's also the very real benefits that are brought to that child, to that infant, as they are baptized. Um, so really quickly, as we get into what are the benefits of baptism, again, we'll, we'll dive into this big time next week. Um, but faith is increased, faith is given, and faith is grown and nourished within baptism. We'll get into this again quite a bit next week. I know I've said it a few times now, but um, Luther especially drove home the point that when you're suffering under sin, when you're suffering under that guilt and the affliction of sin, what should you do? Remember your baptism. Remember your baptism. Say to Satan, I am a baptized child of God. I have been forgiven. I have been redeemed by the body and blood of Christ. I have been given new life in baptism. Satan has no hold. Satan has no power over me. This sin, this guilt, it doesn't have a place in my life. I've been given a new life. Um, so the benefit, one of the benefits of baptism is that it increases, it nourishes, it sustains our faith in that way. We're also given the gift of the Holy Spirit within baptism. We'll point to a few scriptures next week that speak this way, um, but we see this uh, within Pentecost, especially as the, the Holy Spirit is poured out on the disciples, on the apostles there. Um, we see it as Jesus is baptized, the Holy Spirit descends upon him. 
we believe as well when we are baptized we're given the gift of the Holy Spirit as faith again is worked and renewed and refreshed and built up within our lives within our hearts baptism brings about the forgiveness of sins it washes away our sins kills our old self our sinful self brings us um, to new life and then the last benefit of baptism we'll talk about is that new life this now redeems regenerated life that we're able to live this baptismal life that we're able to walk through um, because of baptism because of the washing away of our sins so the last question I have um, for this week is we're already running up to 15 minutes is um, is baptism necessary for salvation this is where we get just a little bit sticky within Lutheranism within Christianity as a whole is baptism necessary for salvation? Another way to say that is, do you have to be baptized to go to heaven? No. You do not have to be baptized to go to heaven. Scripture says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. There's no mention of baptism within that passage, and it's a beautiful promise, and I speak it all the time to people. Um, baptism is not necessary for salvation, but baptism is necessary. Jesus commands it. Go and baptize. All across his ministry, he says, repent, be baptized. It's taught within the New Testament church, within Acts and continuing forward, be baptized. Corinthians deals at length with baptism. What does it mean that you are baptized? So the best way that we can say this, and it's a little bit of a tension, and we, we have to live within that tension. Uh, I think I spoke a few weeks back about kind of these Lutheran tensions. This is one of them. Baptism is necessary baptism is commanded we should not spurn baptism we shouldn't say it's unimportant no it's it's the highest importance baptism and communion are the highest importance within the church one of the greatest things that we do so it is necessary but it's not necessary for salvation and we have to live within that tension just a little bit we have to be able to say I don't really know why it's set up this way, why God did things this way, um, but this is how Scripture speaks about it. This is how uh, Jesus and the apostles spoke about it. This is how we have to speak about it as well. We'll dig into that. We'll dig into that next week. We'll really walk through Romans, especially next week, and see what Paul has to say about baptism, what the catechisms have to say about baptism as well. So I guess you can picture this a little bit as an overview of the sacraments in baptism. Um, after baptism, we'll journey into the Lord's Supper as well and spend quite a bit of time talking about what the body and blood of Jesus Christ are, uh, the words of institution, all of those good things. That's going to be it for this week. We're coming up towards 20 minutes now. Um, if you have thoughts, comments, questions, I would love to hear from you. I'd love to engage with you. You can comment below this YouTube, um, and I'll be checking those. I can write back to you there. You can also email me, Pastor Andrew at stpaulboca.com, Pastor Andrew at stpaulboca.com. I'd love to interact with you in that way as well. Till next week, hope you have a blessed week in the Lord. See you guys.